Welcome to the Stories or Soul Food podcast with your hosts, Brian Cole and best selling author, N.D. Wilson. This audio is brought to you by Cannonball Books and Great Homeschool Conventions. Great Homeschool Conventions are the homeschooling events of the year, offering outstanding speakers, hundreds of workshops on today's top parenting and homeschooling topics, and the largest homeschool curriculum exhibit halls in the United States of America. We believe passionately in the God-given right and responsibility of parents to train and educate their children. Welcome to episode five of the Stories or Soul Food podcast. Is it just five? At this point, I feel like it should be 57. It's just five. (laughs) (laughs) It does... uh, Episode five, Stories are Soul Food. Stories are Soul Food. Soul Food, comma, Stories are. Yep, that's the dictionary entry. (laughs) (laughs) Well, here we are today talking about other kinds of writing for kids, specifically kid poetry and... Stories are Soul Food, Words are Soul Food. Yeah. Language is soul food. And we've been talking about poetry or sorry, writing in the, you know, eight and up age range. But I know that you've actually written a lot for the under eights. I have. The wee digits. I don't know. I don't know about a lot, but I have in fact written. Not <laughs> not in terms of word counts. Okay, sure. So I've, you know, millions and millions of keystrokes have gone into writing for middle grade and up. Far fewer keystrokes have gone into writing for those wee ones. <laughs> yeah. But well, it, so actually, it actually yeah. is a little bit difficult in its own way. But there's a, any, anyone who has read Hello Ninja, of that My Little Board book slash picture book, to a young child understands the nature of chubby poetry. When you have words that are chubby, that bounce, that have, you know, big ups and downs and are sticky, it's really, really funny how quickly kids memorize them. They absorb them so, so fast where if you said, you know, whatever, uh, some fun fact about Nevada uh, in the same number of syllables, they're not going to remember it. But if you say ninjas hop, ninjas chop, ninjas love to belly flop, or even better, ninjas love to belly flop, (laughs) which is how I did it in the audio book, they hang on to it forever. Just the bounce. And we do too as adults. We also do. Just God made, God made the world in a way that language with rhythm and with bones, with percussion built into the, the vocabulary, into the structure and the arrangement of that vocabulary is like coating an almond with chocolate. You know, it just is far more desirable. <laughs> yeah. The, and it's the earworm ability of your Hello Ninja book is pretty crazy. Right. Like, that I, one went well. <laughs> yeah. How quickly it seems that the kid instantly has it all memorized. I'm sure everyone who's seen the TV show has the opening credit of them all <laughs> shouting it yeah. also as well. You know? Yeah. You know, just the number of parents who reached out to me after Hello Ninja was released and said that their children now believed that they knew how to read, that it became the book that the two-year-old and the three-year-old would read to others because they had it completely memorized immediately. <laughs> you know, it was just without effort. Yeah. And for, for my kids, before I went with, before I wrote Hello Ninja, I actually would love reading Fox and Socks. And I would read Fox and Socks aloud with them, but I would read it at maximum speed and maximum inflection. Can you do a little bit of that right now? Or has, oh, it, been, has it been too long? I'm trying to remember Fox how Fox and that... Socks, Bricks and Brock, all the Bricks and Blocks and, you know, oh, yeah, Chicks yeah. with Clocks come. <laughs> it's, it's, it's all rhymey, but tongue twistery. Is that P.D. James? Tweedle, <laughs> Tweedle Beetle's Battle. When Tweedle Beetles fight, it's a Tweedle Beetle Battle. When Tweedle Beetles Battle in a Puddle with a paddle. You know, it's like, it's like <laughs> Tweedle Beetles battle in a bottle with a puddle and the puddle is the yada, 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 yada. Yeah, and I loved awesome. going at maximum speed. So, right. you know, uh, blue goo and the goo goose is chewing the blue goo, the goo glue that, <laughs> the, you know, it's just like gluey glue <laughs> for chewy chewing. The thing is funny is that all that stuff, when you write stuff like that, like Seuss did in some of his best stuff or like Hello Ninja, uh, what I was trying to do with Hello Ninja or with Blah Blah Black Sheep. Your other, your yeah, other. the other one, which I also like, the one with the plot. <laughs> it, you're what you're doing is you're not writing blue goo for chewy chewing. You're writing words for chewy chewing. You're you're writing sentences 
that will be absorbed really forever. You know, they get in there. Yeah. They get in there like a song and they just, they show up with a soundtrack yeah. and little kids love them. Yeah. My dad wrote a poem, Ramble Tam and Tumble Under, comes the sound of marching thunder. Uh, on the walls, defenders wonder, Ramble Tam and Tumble Under. And every one of my children at different points has memorized that poem of their own volition. Mm. And it's because of the chubbiness of it. Like they don't know, they don't understand meter at all, but they can hear the drums. Mm. You know, they can hear the drums and the words. They can hear the drums in Hello Ninja. They can hear the drums in Fox and Socks. They can hear it in Ramble Tam or any number of poems, Kipling, other, other kinds yeah, of poetry. My, my son's memorizing uh, from a railway carriage, Kipling's right, right now. With the whistle and the battle and it feels like a railway carriage just tumbling on and on for speech meet. But yeah, I, I guess the question is, it, it sounds so fun. Do you feel that it's less valuable than the millions? Obviously, you, you, the millions of keystrokes versus what, what's the place of, of kid poetry? Uh, what's the place of chocolate milk? <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's, you know, there, and any comfort food. When they're little, like, what do they need? They don't need Tolstoy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They need exciting, riveting stories that will inspire and catechize their imaginations. When they're littler than that, they need joy, and they need the joy of words and language. Yeah, and to get them that early on, we'll train their instincts to identify rhythmic prose and quality prose later. So, you know, you you are giving them distilled language, and the meaning is less important than the rhythm, the percussion. So they're picking up the drum beat. It's kind of like yeah. your first songs on the piano. Which songs are more important? The songs you play in your fifth year of piano or the songs you play in your first year of piano? It's like, <laughs> well, I mean, that's kind of, it's a false comparison. So thanks for nothing, Brian, yeah. for asking a, <laughs> a false contrast. <laughs> but, um, you know, the, those first songs, those first things that really instill a comprehension of music and tempo and other things are essential. They're, they're a starting point. And I think the same is true for anyone who wants their kid, their child to grow up to have a sophisticated palate and really good instincts and be able to engage with high level, difficult writing needs to start with Jabberwocky and Lewis Carroll. Yeah. Why have all of my children and everyone else's children in the history of mankind wanted to memorize the Wallace and the Carpenter? <laughs> and not all of it, just the good bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. Just the time has come, the Waller said, to talk of many things, of shoes and ships and sealing wax, of cabbages and kings, yeah. of why the sea is boiling hot and whether pigs have wings. Like every, every one of yeah. my kids has wanted that. So, but um, 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 we could swap in lots of different words into a poem like that and kids would want it badly. They would enjoy yeah. it. Yeah. But it seems like it's pretty hard to do based, oh, yeah. based on when you head to the library and look through the kids section, there are not many books that have high repeatability. No. Wild stickiness. Yeah, that's very, very true. And uh, you take somebody like Dr. Seuss and you say, why aren't all his books as good or as sticky? Yeah. Why aren't all the pages as sticky as the other pages? Why are there high points and low points? And that's mm -hmm. because of, you know, the thought poetry too. So you pair the rhythm with a uh, surprise of meaning with ominousness or joy and you have the words match, the illustrations match or have the, have the words be a little bit funny paired with the chubby poetry and then it really goes. So okay. with Hello Ninja, yeah. you know, ninjas hop. How complex is that? Not at all. Ninjas chop. And then the unexpected thing is ninjas love to belly flop. Uh, and I've heard from many, many, many people who have said how funny it is that their children now believe that ninjas love to belly flop. I have <laughs> been like, actually, and I have seen many videos, many that have been sent into my website or Facebook or other places at conferences where they are showing me footage of their kids belly flopping on purpose into little kiddie <laughs> pools in the backyard. Uh, because it's what this is what do. ninjas do. I'm a ninja. Yeah. So ninjas love to belly flop. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. It seems like that doesn't go away for adults either because Richard Wilbur writing his opposites, his poems yeah. about opposites or T.S. Eliot's cat poetry. Yeah. <laughs> Book of practical cats. Yeah. McCavity, McCavity, all that stuff. I, and then it reminds me I mean, of- I A.A. Milne ultimately is the king. Yeah. I mean, Milne is the absolute king of writing 
prose and poetry that captures every imagination from the age of four up. Yeah. You know, James, James, Morrison, Morrison, whether it be George Dupree said to his mother, whatever it is, the next line, don't ever go down into the town unless you go down with me. Yeah. And then J, J, M, M or whatever. He he does hilarious variations on it. Yeah. I was thinking you were talking about the poems in Winnie the Pooh. Yeah. Those those are great too. Yeah. Yeah. But just any mail, anything except for his murder mysteries. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, the more it snows. Yeah, I, I see it. I need to go back and reread and memorize what I knew as a child. <laughs> oh, I'm just a little black rain cloud. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yep. hovering over the honey tree. Wondering where and when I will die. Yeah, I'm yeah. just a little black, black rain cloud. Pay no attention to little me. <laughs> yeah. Well, for some reason, I Everyone keep... knows that a rain cloud doesn't eat honey. No, not a drip. Oh, it's so good. I, I like hearing you talk. I hadn't thought about writing children's books and in with the same tension and surprise and danger that you do a novel but it makes sense of why i have not liked some manuscripts that have been sent to me in children's book form yeah when really there shouldn't be anything wrong with it but it just well it, it lacks the tension and the danger and everything that i'd want in a in a big kid book right and here's here's something for all you aspiring well and many of you are aspiring writers for young children people who want to write picture books or rhymes or anything like that Children should not be treated like morons. And that is unfortunately how most children's writers treat them. That, that's it. And the same thing is true of children's illustrators. So, if you look historically, you look back at things like N.C. Wyeth's illustrations and he was illustrating for young readers. He's illustrating for children and his stuff soars. You know, the artistry is magnificent. Kids love beautiful and striking and compelling things. They love them. They don't want to be patronized. They don't want to read stories that uh, are written as if they had written them themselves. So, Mm -hmm. when children's illustrators do anything, and you see this everywhere in animation, you see this in kids' books, and and it ebbs and flows. When people illustrate kids' books as if they were a child themselves, like they were holding the crayon in their fist. Yeah. You know, and like, hey, kids are dumb. They'll think this is a great illustration. I'm going to hold the crayon in my fist and I'm going to draw fist characters for them. And I'm going to animate as if I'd cut these characters out of construction paper and I was six, you know? Yeah. <laughs> the thing is that kids love stuff that's excellent and striking and inspiring, things they have, to, they have to aspire to, not things that look like their neighbor kid who's their age did it. And so when adults dumb it down and they think kids are stupid, they don't need something compelling. They don't need something surprising. They just need whatever words I can think of in any given three minutes. Yeah. Because I can can insult them. I can overlook them as an audience. I don't need to put the time in. Yeah. Uh, And that's kind of how it goes. So, I'll write, yeah, my my meter will be like, whatever. Like, it doesn't really matter. It'll be occasionally metric. Right. It will occasionally rhyme. So frustrating to read a lot. It'll occasionally rhyme. And it also will bring no mental surprises at all. You know, there will be, there will be no unexpected jokes. There will be no anything. Mm-hmm. So, in Hello Ninja, one of the favorite lines is, of course, as I already mentioned, ninjas love to belly flop. But la- later on, we have ninjas love to pose up on their toes every time a blizzard blows. And we have yeah. the illustration of this ninja on a, on a mountaintop under snow. And it's unexpected and funny. And where does he dance? Well, he dances across the noses of crocodiles, you know. Yeah. And, you know, and, and so on. The king of France that he's training is a cat on a unicycle. Yeah. And that, that kind of thing uh, really does surprise and have a stickiness to it, which that book has proven. And I thought it would go well. I thought Hello Ninja would go well. I had no idea how sticky it would be. So, yeah, it's gone not just well, it's gone globally. Yeah. You know, many, many millions of kids are all about it. And that was not my expectation. (laughs) Yeah. No. So, I was trying to write something that would make my then three-year-old able to memorize it virtually overnight. You know, something that she would really love and be able to absorb and retain Mm -hmm. and own. Yeah. Almost instantly. Because for me, that was kind of the gauge of whether or not something worked for kids was whether or not they, it gave them the willpower and the desire and the affection necessary for retention. And you got everyone else's three-year-olds as well. Yeah. <laughs> right? It's like a little fish. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's uh, kind of, as I looked through things that I liked, like Sandra Boynton does some amazing things. Yeah. What, I'm trying to remember, Barnyard Dance. 
see if I can, re- it's, it's been a while since I've had a toddler. So yeah, a cow says moo, a sheep says ba, three singing pigs say la, la, la. Yeah. That's a perfect example. Super easy rhythm followed by the unexpected. Right. Like here I am to I patronize you with an animal book. Have you ever seen an animal book, Child, where you are just spoon fed the noises that different animals make with nothing clever or creative, no, nothing unexpected at all, nothing yeah. surprising to make you sit up and take notice. So a cow says moo, a sheep says ba, three singing pigs say <laughs> la la la. Yeah. Oh no, you say that isn't right. A pig says oink all day and night. Rhinoceros is snort and snuff and little dogs go rough, rough, rough. Yeah. And so on. Yeah. No, her counting book does the same thing with all the you, the hippos yeah. counting up and there's... And she misses sometimes too. I mean, she's a genius, but she's uh, e- even uh, great Homer nods. <laughs> <laughs> even Sandra Boynton has some less sticky rhymes. Yeah. Oh, my, oh, my, oh, dinosaurs is great. I mean, really great. Yeah. Barnyard Dance is fantastic. Uh, there's a few like that where she yeah. just soars and she she really manages to hit the rhythm, hit the joy and hit the... Hit the little young soul in a way that surprises and delights. Yeah. And that's what we want from novels for older kids. I want books that surprise and delight. Yeah. What do I want for a three-year-old? I want a book that surprises and delights. Not like, oh, potty humor. Oh, I yeah. surprised you with potty humor. I surprised you with burp jokes or fart jokes. Like, mm-hmm. no, thank you. That's not something we ever did in our house at all. Mm-hmm. But if uh, if somebody actually could surprise and delight with with effort, if they wouldn't patronize and insult the young audience, they put the time in. We bought everything they wrote. <laughs> you know, we, yeah. And I think we had every single Sandra Boyden book and we distilled that down to like the top three or four that my kids always went to. Mm-hmm. And if I could write books as perfect as some of those at any level, I'd be thrilled. Yeah. That, and, and I think another part about what she does really well that, that I think Hello Ninja did too is resolve. Yeah. It, it, uh, because it goes along and along and then it comes home to a landing. And I, and I remember talking to some people about st- the story structure or the lack of story structure right. in their picture book. And they look at you like you're crazy. Like, what are you talking about? It's like, yeah. no, you have, to, you have to rise and fall. You have to have yeah. a zenith. You have to right. grow and launch and then you have to come home. Yeah. And that, um, and that resting is why what makes a great bedtime book. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it is. And so, with... Uh, again, to keep referencing Ninja, at the end of Ninja, when I get to watch videos of kids who think they can read, uh, reading the shorter board book version, uh, not the longer picture book version, or either one, really. Yeah. But I've seen more videos of the board book version. When they get to the end, and, uh, and when a ninja is sent to bed, he saddles up a dragon's head and soars away into the night to chop and dance until it's light. Yeah. And then, hello, ninja, and the quick, shh, not yet. Yeah. Uh, ninjas ninja hard all day. They need to sleep before more, they play. Yeah, more surprise. And that tension like, shh, like no. Like, hello, ninja from the beginning. Yes, hello. And at the end, hello, ninja, shh. And the kids get so into the correction. Like, shh, not yet. Like, shh, you be yep. quiet. Yep. And parents love it because the little kid is now saying, quiet. You know, at the end of the book, the kid's not bouncing away yelling. The kid's yeah. saying, everyone be quiet. Right. We're going to sleep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and Forrest's Dickinson's illustrations there with pretzel. All yeah, away, uh, yeah. no, he's, it's perfect. Forrest illustrated the book beautifully. So, anyway, enough about Hello Ninja. The yeah. point is, as I sat down to write that, I was consciously trying to learn from Sandra Boynton. I was consciously trying to learn from Lewis Carroll uh, and Seuss, like those things which delight and they, in delighting, are retained and affect taste and they also become kind of the standard of judgment for the next thing those kids read. When you give your kids something excellent at any level, you don't want them to be a vacuum cleaner. You don't want them to be a baby bird where they have no discernment whatsoever. When you give them something excellent, you want them to then learn what excellent is. And the next thing they retain, the next thing they absorb is compared to it. Yeah. So, you've read Narnia and then you read another series and you're like, is it as good as Narnia? They have something, a rubric to work with. Same thing's true for a three or four-year-old. When they're grabbing a book for you to read off, you know, before they're sent to bed, when they run to the shelf, which one do they pull off? That tells you a lot. Yeah. It tells you a lot right there. It's probably not to be mean, but it's probably not the one that grandma sent. <laughs> it's probably not the one that she wrote and hired a friend to illustrate. Yeah. You know, because she might love them plenty, but, you know, delight and inspire is a little more difficult. Gotcha. Yeah. And uh, I guess 
that applies to tastes as well because if you've only ever tasted Hershey's chocolate, you know, and you try a real chocolate, yeah, yeah, I can see, you know, there's a time and a place for for Hershey's, but uh, <laughs> there is, there, there is, and it's with a marshmallow and a graham cracker at a campfire. Yep. yep. Yeah, I mean, as soon as you've really had something profoundly good, you've you've had a really good chocolate truffle, you've had a really good anything. And then somebody hands you the mass market cheap knockoff version, the book from the grocery store with no author. Yeah. You know, the counting book <laughs> with, uh, yeah. that was written by a factory somewhere. Right. Uh, is not as, is not anywhere near as good. Like why can't more Dr. Seuss just be created by a committee somewhere? Yeah. Because committees, committees don't yeah, have Yeah. It, it just can't because what he does, what he accomplishes there requires i think it requires a human soul i mean it requires somebody to really <laughs> to really go through a dance right and a song not to speak against my profession but yeah the editors can be, <laughs> can be soulless when they're thinking just in well terms forget of- <laughs> even forget the editors when you're in a packager and somebody's producing like if you get books at a grocery store usually it is produced without an author usually it's yeah. produced with hired guns whatever yeah nobody's investing in it with themselves all those millions of baby books that are just stock photos with different words put on them. Yeah. Yeah. Those, those same kinds of things. Yep. Well, look at us. We got critical about kids' books. Yeah, we did. <laughs> we did. And we, we've been less snotty about novels than we just got about like picture books and board, board books. Poetry for the little guys uh, is really, really important. Like it is the training of taste and language, but it's such a way to delight. It's such a way to bring joy, unexpected joy and pleasure. Uh, in my house, if two people are hugging, our puppy gets really excited <laughs> yeah, and, he, and he just, he'll come over and jump, you know, to just want to get in there. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of, it really is the same way with little kids where if you are reading something that's well done, that has that kind of percussion and beat and joy and unexpected surprise, you know, that has tension baked in, even to a bedtime rhyme, you watch them come running over to jump on. Yeah. You know, the little guy in the footers is going to come over and try to climb on because you just said three singing pigs say la 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 and they're like oh that one yeah and he'll be yelling oh no like oh yeah. no running over there like wrong yeah wrong anyway I've, I think I've sufficiently sung the praises of Sandra Boynton yeah for sure well, <laughs> better than Kipling <laughs> <laughs> yeah we'll rank them all just to what's who's the goat the goat <laughs> barnyard dance is, <laughs> is the greatest of all time yeah well I think Connecting that to, again, how much we underestimate the little kids. They don't have an ability to, to appreciate. Yeah. Well, I'd say underestimate slash just insult. It's yeah. more like, I don't have time for you. Mm. You know, I'm not going to put any effort into this because this is, this is your lunch and you're stupid. So, I'm going to give you something stupid to ingest as opposed to something yeah. aspirational for you to ingest. Yeah. Like, I got to get you in bed. So, we're going to pick. The shortest the thing short- there is. With no words. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, look. Yeah. Yeah. Or the peekaboo books, the million peekaboo <sighs> books. Yeah. You see the same thing over and over. Terrible. Yep. yep. So don't insult your children. Stop it. <laughs> I think that's a fantastic place that's, to be done. That's where we end. <laughs> Res- respect your children. Give them stuff that makes their little imaginations. Even the board aspire. books. Make yeah. them aspire to great things. Uh, and to percussive and, chub- and chubby rhymes. There we go. Percussive, chubby. <laughs> Greatness. Just like your toddler. Percussive and chubby. That is very accurate. That's all for today from Stories Are Soul Food. Get on it. If you don't have Sandra Boynton, order the complete set immediately. <laughs> we don't even get a kickback. <laughs> we do it for free. Thanks for listening to this week's edition of the Stories Are Soul Food podcast. Before I let you go, I wanted to let you know about N.D. Wilson's series of Old Testament picture books. Prepare to see the Garden of Eden as you always wish you could. Tangible, leaves rustling, the scent of fruit on the breeze. This beautiful and imaginative children's book brings the story of our parents' fall to life and points to the work of Jesus Christ, the greater Adam. This retelling by children's author N.D. Wilson and illustrator Peter Bentley looks at the story of our parents with wild realism, but also with a childlike honesty and clarity that brings new depth to an old truth. You can find the Old Stories series at Canon Press 
www.thepodcastnetwork.com. 